Ik weet niet, Emma, hoe je het wilt doen, maar met deze microfoon is dat goed? I have no idea what you just said. Thank you very much. Um, I guess that was my introduction. So, um, hi, I am very sorry I was not told that this was in Dutch. Um, and if I was, I would not be here. Um, uh, right, uh, this is the first speech I've ever been asked to give, so I'm rather excited. Uh, I uh, thank you uh, for my fans in the back. <laughs> We didn't even come forward, but I write the back. Um, all right, so uh, <laughs> I was asked to talk a little bit about my uh, my journey as an entrepreneur, which is a surprising one, um, and kind of like how my education affected that. So if I fall down during this, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm going to stand a little bit further back because uh, I, I don't trust myself. So um, my name's Emma Holmes, as I've just been introduced, um, and I work, I'm a food technologist. Technically, this one person thought that was great. Uh, this usually happens to us. Uh, so I'm a food technologist, and I, I came here uh, seven years ago to start. <laughs> that surprised someone um, to uh, to study food tech, and I graduated within the four years I was supposed to. I had good work experience, decent grades, and I was ready to hit the workforce. Uh, and then a year after that, I founded my company, which is called uh, EH Productions. Um, and you go, oh, a food production company, that makes sense. And I go, no, <laughs> an events production company. Um, uh, so I, I specialize in events production and uh, soft skill training for, uh, well, specializing in the performing arts. So I, I, I sway, swayed away a little bit from what I was supposed to be doing. And uh, so the question might be, like, you know, how and why? Uh, so I thought I would start this talk by uh, giving you a little bit of uh, food for thought because that's the, uh, the only kind of food I can offer to this program. Um, and I would start with kind of uh, two statements which I believe to be completely true and very much my own opinion uh, and also very contradictory. So the first one is that I believe that entrepreneurship cannot be taught. The second one is I also believe that VHL was instrumental in my education towards entrepreneurship. So, by, uh, I know, right? It's confusing. Um, some of the, that wasn't even a joke. I wasn't even prepared for that part. <laughs> now it is. Um, so, yeah, so the reason I, uh, so I don't think that entrepreneurship can be taught, but I do believe it can be trained. And there is a very, like, a subtle but really important difference here, which is that uh, teaching is very knowledge-based and training is a lot more uh, skill-based. So by means of an example, a, a discipline that is easily taught would be something like history. Uh, you have to read and learn and absorb and, and recite. Uh, a discipline that could only be trained would be something like football, something I'm not an expert in. Um, however, I do know that if you spend hours upon hours looking at YouTube videos about how to strike a ball perfectly into the goal, it'll do you no use if you don't go out and actually kick one. So that's the difference between teaching and training, and in that sense, entrepreneurship is very much like a muscle. Uh, the, the, like, in the same way that world-class footballers become world-class, is because they go out and they try and they fail, and they try again, they fail again, and they get up and they adapt and they try and do better. And uh, we entrepreneurs are exactly the same. Uh, we try, we fail regularly, uh, we try again, and we adapt, and uh, we try some more, and eventually we hope that we will also become world class. So, that's where the difference lies. And my, like, I, I can only give you experience through, through stories, really, and my first uh, conscious encounter with entrepreneurship came when I was about 15 years old. Uh, it was the Christmas of 2007, if I remember correctly. And my father uh, thought it was a great idea to announce to uh, his family, which was my sister, myself, and my mother, that we were going to be entering forcefully into a competition the following year. And the competition was amongst the four of us, and there was three parts to it. The first would be who could take the best portrait picture throughout the year. The second would be who could take the best landscape picture throughout the year. And the third would be who could make the best slideshow of 2018. 2018, that was now. Uh, 2008. At the time. So, um, and the thing was, you could win money, which is very exciting when you're 15. Um, and the landscape and the portrait competitions could win you 25 euros each, but the big bucks, the big bucks was in the slideshow. You could win 50. 
And I was like, that Christmas day, I set my heart on winning that slideshow the next year. And I have never worked so hard, as my teachers can tell you. Um, they didn't experience that part of me. But I was completely convinced that uh, once to win this competition, I worked so hard. I took hundreds of pictures throughout 2008. And I learned how to use Windows Movie Maker. And I spent hours trying to work out you know, the perfect amount of time a picture or a piece of text has to be on screen for it to be comfortable but not too long. And I spent long autumn evenings trying to pair my music and then repairing it so that my story had the right feeling to it. And by the time I finished, I thought it was perfect. Um, and uh, the, 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 I had, to, had it in the 1st of December and I did and I was, I was quite confident because my father and sister had thrown together rather their slideshow very last minute and my mother had just not entered. Um, because mothers can do that. Um, daughters cannot. Uh, so I was, I was really ready. There was like a slight discrepancy. There was one small thing, which is that my slideshow was at 20 minutes long, was 10 minutes longer than it was supposed to be. I was like, okay, fine. Um, so Judgment Day came, Christmas Day came round, and we had this big viewing next to the Christmas trees of a big TV screen, and we saw all the different slideshows, and it was clear that mine was at least the most worked on. <coughs> Best. Um, so, you're way ahead of me. Um, so my father pulls out this envelope, because being my father, he had thought about who was going to judge this, and so he had asked a friend, if, a photographer friend, if he would do the, be the judge. And so he pulls out this envelope, and he reads, and he announced the slide slideshow winner first thing and says, well, uh, even though Emma's was probably the best, she couldn't, she was disqualified because it was too long. He, I was heartbroken. I was absolutely, like, I was so heartbroken. I was miserable on Christmas, first off. Um, and I, I just, like, I, I spent so, like, so much time on it. Like, I had won my 50 euros. I won both the portrait and the landscape. So where we started, I got the 50 euros I wanted to, but it was no longer about the money. See, it had become a passion project at this point. And some stranger had had the audacity to stamp on it. <laughs> so I, I was really, I was heartbroken. And, um, and also, unfortunately, this may sound a little morbid, but there is no better metaphor to describe the daily emotional roller coaster that is the life of an entrepreneur. Because um, entrepreneurship is very like the Holmes' 2008 photo competition. In the sense, it starts with the idea of you wanting money, but then you get excited and it kind of engulfs you and it becomes more than just a job. It becomes like this, this fire inside you to see your project succeed. And you work very long hours, you get paid very little, and uh, within the snap of the fingers, like a, a, a casual acquaintance or a close family member or a potential investor can stamp on your work at any moment. And, and that is how entrepreneurship works. The difference is that us entrepreneurs, what we do is we mourn our egos for a couple of days um, because it hurts. Uh, and then we get up and we dust ourselves off and we say, fine, let me bloody well show you. And we go back out and we start again. And so, in that sense, like, as I said, this is like my first encounter with entrepreneurship. So the story doesn't quite end there. Uh, that night, on Christmas night 2008, Father, um, I was sitting in my room very miserable, and I think to console me, my dad had tried to come in and, and talk to me. And he sat down and he said to me, he's like, oh, he goes, Emma, like, that was a good movie. Like, you, 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 did, you did well. You could do something with that talent. And I was like, I couldn't win, could I? Because um, I was 15 and hormonal, because that's what we teenage girls are. Uh, anyway, he ignored that. And he said, uh, he said to me, he goes, like, why don't you go and make a movie about the brickwork factory that's just down the road? Make a small movie and go to them, and you can probably try and sell it for like 20 euros. And it didn't take much for the dollar signs to come back. Uh, and I was like, okay. So I, I made that movie. I, I made the movie. And this is where we would all like to take a moment and, and you know, cheer for the idea of a happy ending to Emma's plight. However, <laughs> story of my life. Um, so however, like many wannabe entrepreneurs, um, I never had the courage to go and talk to the manager. So I never sold that movie. I made it and it sat on a shelf for years. But that is, you know, if you don't take a leap of faith, you're not going to go anywhere. So, now, <laughs> the next part's going to surprise you. So, is it maybe hard to believe I was a shy child? <laughs> Again, that wasn't a joke. Um, so yeah, I was, I was a very 
very shy child, as a matter of fact. My my mother even took me to these like these social classes for young children, which I hated. Um, and I yeah, I was I, I can still remember the anxiety of just meeting new people. Um, anyhow, it, it took like it's another complete another story about how this happened. Uh, but it basically took three countries, two languages, and the weird and wonderful city of Vatnik just down the road to do it. Um, but uh, when I got to university, I did university right, or at least in my opinion. Again, sorry, professors. Um, so I, uh, when I when I first got here, I had the introduction week, and I'm not someone who makes friends easily. At least I thought I wasn't until I came to this introduction week because I had lived in France for most of my life, and um, I never I always struggled to make friends. And I thought I wasn't a social person. And I got this introduction week, and everyone seemed to like me. I thought, oh, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's the French. <laughs> Week and it went well, and I spent the first year of university kind of learning about new cultures and, and meeting people from all around the world and traveling as much as I could. And the second year I spent drinking and partying, which is what I probably should have done in the first year. Uh, and by the time the third year came around, I was kind of bored. Um, see, I'm a, I'm a bit of a contradiction of a character because I struggle to focus, I struggle with concentration. But simultaneously, if I don't have like a project to sink my teeth into, I feel lost. Um, and so I went back to what I, I used to do when I was a teenager, which was just to try everything and see if anything sticks. Uh, so I took up cycle touring, uh, I took up, I went, I brewed beer with my best friend and took it to the Echotrophilia competition. Another competition I should have won, <laughs> recurring themes, this talk. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I even set up a radio station for one day just to see if I could. So uh, none of these things stuck. Uh, and I, I continued all my life, and then my thesis came around. And one side note here is I forgot that my thesis supervisor is here today, so uh, Marcel, please close your ears. Um, so by the time I was a, a the, by the time as a thesis student, I was already performing stand-up comedy. So I had taken up stand-up comedy and um, had, had gone on stage a few times. And uh, I saw a gap in the market because Vatninga, which is just down the road, a very international city, as some of you will know, um, it, it was limited on what you could do in the evenings. You had, as an international student, you could go for dinner or drinks with friends, or you could go and watch live music. And so I was like, oh, I can see a potential here. I'm a stand-up comedian. What I should do is start a monthly, so regular, uh, English-spoken, possibly niche, uh, stand-up comedy night. I was the only stand-up comedian I knew. <laughs> And if you buy me a beer, I'll tell you how, actually. But um, I, I, I think I came down to optimism and charm on my part, perhaps. But uh, it went well, and within the year, um, it had gone from kind of being, it became a staple in Vatnia. We had like over 100 people at each show, it was super popular. And so when the second year came around, and I found myself unemployed, I thought, well, maybe I'll just try and do more of this. Um, my, my parents are very proud. Oh, food technologist and stand up comedian. Um, <laughs> It's still a conversation for Christmas dinner, so <laughs> I should have won the competition. Um, so I, uh, what we did instead is we, we took the, the concept and we just replicated both in Wageningen and around the place. So we had, you know, we, had, we did storytelling, we did poetry slam, we did science slam, we did uh, comedy and improv, and we did all kinds of stuff, both in Wageningen and we took it to, to here in Ireland, we did Harlem and Hofdorp and so on, and the likes, and um, uh, by the time yeah, that was like they had varying successes. Uh, some went well, some didn't do so well. But I always knew that as a business model, uh, shows were not sustainable. Because first of all, it's a young man's game, and with every year that would go by, I would get older too. <laughs> it's apparently a thing. Um, and secondly, uh, it was really long, awkward hours, and it was also uh, how do you say that? Uh, you, you were basically limited by how much you could push out. And so I, I'm getting, pissed, I'm getting nervous here. You, you two are not in the slightest bit discreet. Um, thank you, whoever did that, I'm very appreciative. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so where was I? Yeah, so I, we, we basically pushed them out as much as we could. And um, uh, what I did is I was looking for other opportunities and I realized that, it's quite dark in here as well, isn't it? Um, 
um, I realized that uh, the business is, is quite similar to the performing arts. It may not sound like it, but it is. So, uh, you know, every sales pitch is kind of a performance, and the success of a team is basically based on two things. Their ability to communicate, both verbally and non-verbally, and their ability to collaborate. Uh, two things that performing artists have understood. And so I thought, well, maybe I can take this and develop it into workshops and into team buildings. And that's how the soft skills side of my company started to develop. And hopefully it will be more sustainable within the future. Um, now, as you can see, my time is ticking to an end as my two, uh, my yellow and red uh, people came towards me. Uh, so I'm going to, if, if it's okay with you, I would like to leave you with three things that I, I, I learned from BHL during my time here that have been like, really useful to me as an entrepreneur. And also three things I, like, I would have liked to have known earlier. Um, so let's start with the stuff I learned at BHL. The first one is how to run a project. Now, at the end of the day, it is the best training for an entrepreneur is how to run a project, how to start, how to do, and how to finish. Uh, and without a doubt, because the whole education system here is based on projects, whether it's per period or per semester, we were always doing projects and, and learning to work in small groups and big groups and different disciplines and with different nationalities was the best education in entrepreneurship that I could have had. There's no better one. Secondly, it was confidence. Um, so, I, have, I had the most amazing mentor here at VHL. Her name is Joyce Pullman, you may know her. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's loud and she's colorful and uh, somehow, I think we cloned, I'm not sure. Um, and I don't remember if Joyce remembers this, but I remember sitting down, I think just after my first internship, and she said, we sat down and she said to me, she goes, okay, Emma, what did you do well during your internship? I went, well, I, I think I was quite good at the, the, the communication. She goes, no, 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 no stop. <laughs> I went, okay. Um, she goes, no, no, she goes, she goes, you need to sell yourself. You've got to be confident about this. I did well at. And I went, I did well at. <laughs> She goes, no, try it again. I was like, I, 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 this conversation went on for a while. And I didn't realize how actually instrumental that conversation was to me until quite recently when I hosted an Entrepreneurship for Business Women event. And I realized that we are incredibly underrepresented in entrepreneurship. Ladies, we are the best entrepreneurs. <laughs> I love you men, but we have a more realistic ability of understanding ourselves. <laughs> uh, so ladies... So ladies, please gain some confidence and join me in the entrepreneurial word. Word? World. The third thing that I learned is, is quite self-evident, it's business skills. Um, as we, uh, here at VHL we teach trade, as per se, um, and to learn also just the basics of business was amazing because it meant that I understood kind of what my business was supposed to be doing. Not completely, but kind of. Um, and also I knew how to approach people who would know more than I did. So that was very useful. So the three things that um, <laughs> I wish I'd known earlier, when I wrote this, I realized that there was about 50 of them. Um, and I had to somehow pick three. Uh, so what I did is I went for the ones that I thought were the most surprising and probably that you could also help teach your students with. The first one um, is that you can start with nothing. Now no one tells you this as an entrepreneur. You, you're told that you should go and, and, and try and get money from pitches and the likes. But you, I started, everything I started has started with zero investment and it has grown. And it's the most organic way to, to, to run a business because it means that you also, you put money above your passion because your aim is to make money but also to, to enjoy what you do. And so learning, that was very empowering to learn that you actually didn't need to start with something. You can start just from your own time, as per se. Secondly, um, it's a lonely path to walk. See, uh, entrepreneurship, it's very hard to find mentors and peers in entrepreneurship. And so you need to surround yourself with friends and family who are both supportive, but also challenging you. Um, that has helped me, I think, drive my company further. And finally, uh, the last one is you have to be something that I have made up a word called flexible stubborn. So, <laughs> The idea is that you need to have, um, to learn the balance between when to fight for what you believe in and when it's probably not worth the effort. Because it will save you so much time and it will be incredibly useful and it's an instinct. Like you have to train that instinct, but it will be the best, like the well spent, like the, the best time you can put into something is learning how to be both flexible and stubborn. And on that note, uh, now that you've learned about me and what I am and who I am and etc and etc, I would like to thank you very much for listening because I'm, I'm undoubtedly over time and I'm very sorry. Um, thank you so much and I hope that this was helpful and have a wonderful academic year.